Hi everybody, my name is Michelle and welcome to Cardiac Rehab, the intro lecture at Cambridge Cardiac Rehab. I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Michelle. I happen to be a pharmacist, but I think most importantly, I happen to be the person uh, who happens to be a family member of someone who had her first heart attack at 53, was diagnosed with diabetes at that time, and had to undergo a three vessel bypass. A few years later, 10 years later, she needed to have an angioplasty, which was a stent. And then a few years later was diagnosed with heart failure. And then subsequent to that developed atrial fibrillation. A few years later, she had to undergo valve surgery. And I think that entire 17 year journey with heart disease allowed me to understand some of the struggles that you are going through as an individual but also what some of the struggles you are going through as a family dealing with someone with heart disease. So I invite you in this lecture to, um, to um, maybe share it with other family members or people that are involved in your healthcare so they can understand what you're going to be going through in cardiac rehab. During the pandemic, we are going to be wearing masks in cardiac rehab and everybody who is coming on site to exercise is double vaccinated. I encourage all of you to please uh, speak to your family, uh, family doctors or your healthcare providers to find out if you should be getting uh, further COVID vaccines. But at our center, we recommend that you get the bivalent vaccine, the most current one out, even though you've just had the other two vaccines, because then at least you're up to date. So why are we here in cardiac rehab? Well, some people come to cardiac rehab because they've had angina. And if you are in the uh, chat group right now, if you want to use a symbol or, and let me know if you've had angina, I'll just describe what it is. So angina is this um, medical condition where it's a warning sign that you may be at risk of a heart attack. And it typically has certain symptoms, which we're going to discuss later in the lecture, but it gives you these warning signs of uh, chest pain and shortness of breath and things like that. But the big, but the big takeaway here is it is a warning sign that you may be at risk of developing something called a, a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. So some of you have been referred to cardiac rehab because you've had a heart attack. And during COVID, we've recognized that there's more than one type of heart attack and at least more the general public has. The medical uh, community has always known there are different types of heart attacks. So what is a heart attack? When you have a sudden blockage and that vessel or that, uh, that um, uh, artery in the heart is not getting enough oxygenated blood and it can result in damage to the heart or it can result in that part of the uh, heart um, dying. So it's really important that if you think you're having signs and symptoms of a heart attack that you go to the hospital. Some people come to cardiac rehab because they have diabetes and diabetes happens to be three disease states in one. It happens to be abnormal blood sugar, abnormal cholesterol and abnormal blood pressure. So blood sugar, blood pressure, and uh, the abnormal um, um, cholesterol. So because of that, when you are diagnosed with diabetes, it happens to be a cardiac, a cardiac risk equivalent and your risk factors and everything about you gets taken much more seriously. Some people come to cardiac rehab because they've had a stent or an angioplasty. And what a stent or an angioplasty is metal scaffolding to keep your car, to keep your artery open. The other term for it is PCI or percutaneous coronary intervention. Some people come to cardiac rehab because they've had bypass surgery. And you could have as many as 11 bypasses. David Letterman happened to have had seven bypasses. So if anybody here had had bypass, maybe put, uh, put up your hand or maybe um, put, uh, put a note in the chat field and let us know. But a bypass, I want you to think of it is if you think of your artery as being the 401, if you have a major blockage on it, they take you off the on-ramp before and bring you on the on-ramp right after. Some people come to cardiac rehab because they've had a weakened pump or heart failure. And if you think of a heart as being a two-sided pump, there are lectures specifically in cardiac rehab about heart failure, where the heart just does not pump as effectively 
This results in less blood returning to your heart and less blood being pushed out of your heart. So having said this, heart failure is what we've discovered is when you exercise, you pump becomes stronger as well. In heart failure, you need to go on certain medications to make your heart pump more effectively. Some, uh, some people come to cardiac rehab because they've had valve surgery. And how I want you to think of valves are, there's four valves in your heart that are important. Valves are like uh, doors. The door opens, the blood goes in, the door closes, the chamber fills up. The door opens, the blood goes to the next chamber. And oftentimes, you can have the most important valve within the heart is the aortic valve and that valve is really important at pushing the blood out of the heart to the rest of the body so typically if you have a bicuspid valve or you have a narrowing of the valve which is called stenosis or if the valve is not um is not closing properly you can result in valve surgery and the two most important valves all valves are important in the heart but the two most important are the aortic and the mitral valve. And if they can't do the sternotomy surgery, they will sometimes do either a, um, a TAVI or a mitral clip. But there are, the valves are very, very important and the CV surgeon is gonna send you to cardiac rehab. What I want you to recognize is that atrial fibrillation is a, is a condition in the last few years we've recognized that if you have atrial fibrillation, there's an overlap with heart failure by 30%. So 30% of people with heart failure develop atrial fibrillation and 30% of atrial people with atrial fibrillation develop heart failure. So it's really important that you exercise and you actually get less symptoms with atrial fibrillation when your pump is stronger. I love the last group because this group is the one essentially that um, nothing bad happened to them and perhaps they just have a lot of uh, risk factors and we've caught you early. So this is the group that may have that Framingham risk score of 20% or the one where you've got multiple risk factors and we're catching you early trying to prevent that cardiac rehab, that cardiac event from happening. It could be that you have a positive MIBI also, it could be that you have long COVID, in which case we'll try and exercise you at home and try and build up your strength. It could be that you have POTS, which is postural hypotension, and you need to build up that strength within your heart. It could be that you have SCAD, in which case you um, have had a, uh, um, a spontaneous coronary artery dissection. And again, we've got to build up that strength and that resiliency within your heart. So. People come to cardiac rehab for different reasons. And I hope from me describing it, you found somewhere in there one of the reasons why you think you've been referred to cardiac rehab. Well, this diagnosis of cardiac, uh, uh, cardiac disease doesn't sit well with people. People can feel anxious and angry. How could this happen to me? They could be sad. The hormones released during um, during your cardiac event, like your heart attack or bypass surgery, are the same hormones that are released during depression. So this could result in some people feeling sad. Some people would be shocked going, wait, I had no warning signs and all of a sudden I've had heart disease. Some people could be stressed going, oh my gosh, how am I going to manage? This is happening during COVID. This is happening um, and, and I've got to pay my bills. They could be worried, or in the case of atrial fibrillation, they could be relieved going, wait, this, this is real, this is not in my head, because atrial fibrillation often feels like you're having, your heart is pumping really, really fast and you're sitting still, and sometimes people feel like, oh my gosh, I'm having a panic attack. But no, it is a true medical condition. I want you to recognize that all of these emotions are normal. And sometimes your family may be sitting with you and say, yes, yes, that's you. No, 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 that's you. And you may not recognize this within yourself, but these are normal. And when we ask you, how are you feeling in cardiac rehab? Your go-to answer typically is I'm fine, but it's sometimes you're not okay. And it's really, really important for you to recognize that it's okay. 
and we may refer you to your family doctor to get help with some of these emotions. So what is cardiac rehab? This introduction talk is going to let you understand what you're going to be going through in cardiac rehab. It's basically where you are encompassing all aspects of wellness, physical, dietary, emotional, sexual, work and social reintegration. But in every lecture, we try to also teach you about other things. The education part of it is as important as the exercise part of it. Because if you don't understand why you're exercising, you're going to say, well, I'm not in the mood to come today. Or if you're very stressed, you may find a reason not to come that day. But if we're going to be discussing, um, there's a stress management lecture. There are actually four lectures in your classes while you're exercising that will allow you to understand the dietary part of it. And it's really, really important why you need to make some changes. I will be doing the medication lecture with you and it is an hour and a half lecture. However, that lecture will help you understand why you need to take the medications you're taking and why it's important that you take them. So cardiac rehab involves all aspects of wellness, including physical, dietary, emotional, sexual, and work and social reintegration. What are your goals? A lot of you are coming to cardiac rehab because your physician told you to come. But really, you should be coming because you want to better understand your disease state. You may want to find and find out what your cardiac risk factors are. And then this will help you modify some of them and help you with strategies with exercise, healthy eating, quitting smoking, if those apply to you. This is our cardiac rehab team. And I want you to recognize that there are at least six nurses on here, but there are more than nine nurses in our facility. And they're here to help you along with a cardiologist that's always on site about 95% of the time. The other 5% of the time, there is a family doctor in, the, I'm not family doctor, but there is an eMERGE doctor in the building. I happen to be a pharmacist, I happen to be the clinic manager, and I happen to be the cardiac rehab manager. But alongside is Tony to help me if you have are experiencing some challenges that maybe we could help you in. There is Alicia that's going to be helping you with your appointments and some of these other lectures. But through this week, you're going to be having a series of lectures and we invite you to participate them. Now, typically we will have some of them in class and some of them you can watch through Zoom or through our website. But we encourage you to come into clinic and you're, you're allowed to invite one, one person to attend these cardiac rehab lectures. There is Victoria and Chantal, who are both kinesiologists that are gonna be working with you in the gym along with Laura at times. This is your day-to-day -day cardiac rehab team. Now, at this point, we would have you talk to a cardiac rehab graduate. Every lecture I've ever attended for cardiac rehab has always involved a patient. The patient is the core, the focus, and we need to understand what you're going through. So we will have you evaluate this lecture at the end, but typically we will have a person talk to you. Now, in pre-COVID, this person would have been Patrick, and Patrick would have said, welcome to cardiac rehab. I was exactly in the same place that you were at, and let me tell you something about myself. So Patrick would, would then say some things about himself, but more importantly, he would give you some advice, and the first advice would be ask questions. If you're not asking questions, you're not gaining a lot of information through cardiac rehab because maybe you're not as engaged. And sometimes when you ask a question, other people feel comfortable asking questions. The second thing Patrick would say is have fun. If you're not having fun, when we ask you to exercise at home, you're not going to want to exercise because you're going to say, well, I don't have a big gym, so I can't exercise. But I'll tell you about other cardiac rehab participants and how they've managed. And then the last thing um, Patrick would say is set some goals. If you're not setting goals and personalized goals for yourself, then you're not getting as much out of it. 
because you should be understanding that wait this is about me and i've got to i've got to maybe make some changes because what i was doing wasn't quite right and i may end up in in a similar problem again so let's start off with some definitions the heart is a very hard working muscle and it pumps 4 to 5 liters during uh, rest every minute and so even while you're sleeping the heart is pumping and it's when it's pumping it's a uh, electrical conduction system it's supplying oxygen and nutrients to itself and other parts of the body and it's doing this through the coronary arteries so if you had, had a cardiac catheterization they would have drawn out your arteries and shown where there were blockages but the coronary arteries keep your um keep your heart nourished and strong so I want you to think of your arteries as being like straws. Inside the straw is where the blood is going to flow. But over time, plaque can build up and this plaque can result in narrowing. So this is defined as atherosclerosis, where it's narrowing of the arteries due to build up in the of plaque within the walls. And when this happens in the arteries in the heart, it is called coronary artery disease. Now this is the first question and I want you to unmute yourself if you feel comfortable, but I want you to answer the question at home even if you're by yourself. Plaque builds up and atherosclerosis begins with old age, true or false? And the answer is true. You start off with clean arteries from birth and over time plaque will build up in your arteries and typically if you're male in your fourth decade that you will start presenting signs and symptoms of coronary artery disease but this can happen from birth and and keep in mind like it's it's slowly building up and some people may have this happen as young as 18 some people may have this happen as old as 90 and it it is just a slow accumulation of cholesterol in the form of atherosclerosis and plaque the next question is atherosclerosis affects only the heart true or false well it actually is you are one giant set of plumbing and all your arteries are connected so if you have blockages in your heart it is likely that you also have blockages going up to the neck which can result in ischemic stroke you've got blockages going down your legs which may result in peripheral vascular disease and you may have blockages within your heart which may result in warning signs of angina a heart attack or also called a myocardial infarction or an mi or it could result in a rhythm disorder called sudden cardiac death What are your signs and symptoms that you have angina or heart attack? I want you to recognize that you don't have to have all of them. You could just have some of them. So some people will present as chest pain or an elephant sitting on your chest or a squeezing burning sensation. Some people will tell us they've got sweating, discomfort in other areas, and I will describe that as being anything from your nose to your chest. anywhere any area in between can present as angina so do you remember i described the family member who was diabetic who had heart disease she was also um her angina equivalent was ear pain so she presented with ear pain and that's when she'd have to take her nitro spray or it can result in uh jaw pain pain going radiating down your arm or to the back discomfort in other areas again is from the nose to the chest unless told otherwise that is angina nausea shortness of breath or lightheadedness all of these could be signs and symptoms of angina so what is a heart attack well remember me telling you inside the artery there's build up of plaque but when this plaque builds up and part of it breaks off it may result in a blood clot when it forms um when it when it tears off and it could also block a smaller artery resulting in a lack of blood flow and if this blockage continues the muscle could get damaged or it could die there are at least two different types of heart attacks and we describe that as an ST elevation MI or a STEMI 
or a non-ST elevation MI or an NSTEMI, but there's also different types that could have happened during COVID because they were due to other conditions. So a STEMI is a large vessel fully blocked and it is more dangerous. An NSTEMI is a smaller vessel fully blocked or a larger vessel partially blocked. And this puts you more at risk of a heart attack. So it's important that you understand what type of cardiac event that you had. And we do put this in your booklet at the, uh, at the clinic when you come into cardiac rehab, or you could get this information from your report card or your consult. If you have a cardiac consult with a cardiologist and or the nurse, you can get this information and emerge. And certainly when you travel, love if you can explain what your cardiac condition is. You may have to pay for it, or you may be able to get it from your family doctor for free. Now, delay and getting help if you think you're having a cardiac event can be a big problem and it can result in very bad outcomes. So it's important that you get care fast and it's key that you don't wait more than a few minutes after taking your nitro spray and trying it three times. If it doesn't work, call 911. Please don't come to your family doctor's office or your cardiologist's office because we don't have these clot opening medications. This is only given to you in eMERGE. And I know early in the pandemic, people were too scared to go to the hospital because they were concerned that they may get COVID. Then there was the issue of, oh my gosh, there's not enough uh, ambulances. We don't have enough staffing. But I encourage you not to drive yourself unless you're, you're in a very remote place or have a family member drive you because this can result in have something happening along the way. So why is it important that you go by ambulance? We had a person sitting in cardiac rehab that put up their hand and said, I had my cardiac event in the US. And when this happened, um, I had to go by ambulance. He was a truck driver and this that's why it happened in the US while he was working. He called 911, had to go 17 miles. His bill was 1700 US dollars. He did have a heart attack and a cardiac arrest. However, a $1,700 bill, US dollars, is significantly more than what you're going to get charged, $45. But I flip it around and say, wait, you're going to save on parking because maybe you're going to be there for a few days. So you're going to have emergency providers start treatment en route. They communicate with the eMERGE doctors. You are seen more quickly and the emergency room is ready for you. So time is muscle. And it is important that you don't wait typically more than 30 minutes before you call 911 if you think you're having a cardiac event. And it is okay for you to have a false alarm. So how big is the problem of heart disease? It is still considered the number one killer worldwide, even during COVID, with over 12 million deaths annually. And in the last 30 years, there's been declines in developed countries and increasing numbers in developing countries such as India and China as they move more towards diabetes. Your first question is, why was I so lucky? How did this happen to me? Well, the answer is genetic predisposition. You got gifts from both of your parents and that was, that's what made you so special. So these genes, are predisposing you to heart disease because very likely you have some family members with heart disease. Poor management of fats. You are not converting your, or you're not able to pull your cholesterol out of your body through HDL. And metabolic syndrome, it's the belly fat. Urbanization, we're not meant to be living in these large cities or suburbs like Cambridge. We're meant to be hunter-gatherers and we're meant to be exercising more. We're meant to be farmers. We're meant to be getting more exercise. So one of the things uh, that I saw in a, in a great cardiac rehab lecture was a big X across the couch that said the worst thing you can do is after six o'clock sit there and watch TV the entire time. So I encourage you even during this lecture to get up and you can move around and walk 
or you can do steps while you're watching your favorite TV show or maybe during commercials to get up and take a loop around your apartment or your house or maybe do the stairs and come back because we don't have to buy every one of those things we see on TV. Sudden change in lifestyle from being um, hunter-gatherers and being farmers to now living in these larger cities where we drive everywhere to get to places. So sedentarianism is very, very key that we get enough steps in. So one of the things we talk about is to get a pedometer or uh, uh, they are $10 pedometers. They're fairly inexpensive that you can give to other people. You set them to zero or you could use them on your smartphone. If some of you have a smartphone, there's the ability to count your steps to encourage you to do at least 10,000 steps, 14 to 16,000 steps will get you um, some weight loss if that's what your goal is. So let's go over the cardiac risk factors. They fall into two buckets. The first one is ones you can do nothing about. Every year you have another birthday, every year you age, every year you are more at risk of developing heart disease and women will catch up to men after menopause. Male is an automatic risk factor. Certain nations, certain cultures, certain uh, people with certain genetic pools within five generations, if you identify yourself as First Nations, African descent, South Asian descent or Arabic, you are more likely to develop heart disease and it is thought perhaps it may be due to the fact that you have smaller arteries. This is a doubling of risk where you have, if you have a family history of parents, sibling, children, or any of those, if you have a combination of that, or if you have a family history of a lot of family members developing heart disease, this is a doubling of risk. This is not that equal risk factor. Now, this is the group that I want you to focus on. This is the most important thing I'm going to tell you in this lecture. I will tell you also at the end, 90% of your risk of heart disease is modifiable and controllable by you. I'm talking about coronary artery disease. I'm talking about atherosclerosis, not if you've had valve surgery, that's a slightly different category, but I'm talking about 90% being controllable and modifiable by you. I will come back to that point. If you have high cholesterol, smoking, high blood pressure, diabetes, obesity, alcohol, physical inactivity and stress. These are all things you can control. And when I discuss stress, I want you to think about stress and distress. And there's a full lecture on this. And I really encourage you to watch that lecture. It's on Thursdays. It's about an hour and a half. And I really encourage you to come into clinic and, and see that lecture. So when we talk about stress and distress, the same thing can happen to two different people and it's your perspective of how you handle it. So I want you to think about that fire that occurred in Lytton, BC a few years ago, where the entire town burnt down. Some people, most people in general, will hold their head and go, oh my God, my entire life is gone. All of my, all of my possessions are gone. What am I gonna do? The first day, of course, you're gonna feel sorry for yourself. That's normal. But some people will be able to then the next day say, okay, I've got to call the insurance company. I've got to find a place to stay. I've got to get some clothes. I've got to figure out how to recharge my phone. I've got to, I've got to do these things. And they'll make their list. Everything from their head is on a piece of paper. And if they don't get through that list, it goes to the next day and it goes to the next day. But at least they're functional. So stress can help you get more things done. However, there's the person who's distressed. And that person is not able to function. They're just curled up in a ball in bed and they're basically saying oh my god how am i going to deal with this and they're paralyzed with with their fear so you may be somewhere in between and the key is are you stressed or distressed and how do we move you further to just functioning with a little bit of stress so let's go over each of these risk factors cholesterol is a vital part of the body and it's, sorry, I'm gonna go back to that slide. And it circulates in the blood. So too much cholesterol can form plaque 
and this results in the narrowing of the arteries, but typically there's no symptoms till there's a almost 60%, 70% blockages, and you have no warning signs. But where is cholesterol coming from? 30% of it came from only diet. That's what you ate. The 65% came from genetics and what your body makes up. So remember the food portion, the 35% comes from animal fat and meat products. Now, when you look at cholesterol, and here's the good thing, with lab work these days, you're able to get a copy of your blood work and you're able to see these values. You're able to see what my cholesterol is. And typically there's multiple things we're testing. We're testing LDL, HDL, we're testing triglycerides, we're testing total cholesterol. We may be testing LP little a and other, other little factors as well within their APOB. We're testing a lot of different things. But we typically will start off with LDL, and I want you to recognize this is a calculated number, that there are four subtypes and some are worse than others. But typically, you want your LDL to be less than 1.8. Less than 1.4, if you've got established disease, is going to save two events for every 100 people with established disease, and that came from a clinical trial. So the lower the cholesterol, the better. HDL is your good cholesterol, and it happens to be typically higher in women, and it increases with exercise. So this is what we're hoping for, and it is carrying out your bad cholesterol. So I want you to think of this as your shovel, your your or your garbage truck, and the bigger it is, the higher the number. Typically, it's supposed to be above 1.3 in females and above 1.1 in males. So the higher that number, the more the more you have uh, this thing the better the better you will do now with your cholesterol you typically are going to test that every 20 year above the age of 20 they'll test it typically once if you are in cardiac rehab they may test it more often but just a 10% reduction in your cholesterol will result into a 20 to 30% decline in coronary artery disease and death so going back to that, what did I mean? If you started off at 2.5 and you drop that cholesterol by 0.25, you will then decrease your chances of having a cardiac event by 20 to 30 percent. Now, I don't know if anybody here has used tobacco products in the last six months, but nicotine is not the problem. It's actually the cigarette. There are 7,000 chemicals, over 7,000 in a cigarette, 70 of which are known carcinogens like mercury, toluene, car battery fluid, uh, arsenic, all sorts of things that you shouldn't be taking. And if I asked you to take any of that, you go, Michelle, that's wrong. You cannot ask me to take that. However, these are all in that delivery system of a cigarette. So we'll often, every cardiac rehab program has a smoking cessation or a smoking reduction which even if we stick on a patch and give you clean nicotine, that will result in you having um, less risk coming from cigarette smoke. So what happens with cigarette smoke? Well, it increases your blood pressure. It decreases your HDL. It damages your arteries and blood cells and predisposes you to diabetes. It increases your chances of having a heart attack by putting in 7,000 chemicals, 70 of which are known carcinogens. Having said that, it is now legal to use, um, to certainly vape, and it's, it's legal to use marijuana. But I want you to recognize that uh, vaping comes with its own risks as well. And it sometimes will just increase that, um, increase that craving or it will perpetuate it. So what we recommend is um, nicotine replacement therapies or other medications. We have uh, a nurse within our clinic that will help you to help you decrease and she does it virtually so she can meet your timings. We also encourage you to spend time, certainly pharmacists and other clinics will help you decrease and quit smoking. But marijuana also comes with risk. And even though it's legal, we encourage you not to smoke it because when you smoke a joint, unfortunately there's no filter in it and it is actually worse for you than a cigarette so we will encourage you to either use topicals or edibles in place of um, smoking 
uh, or use it through a hookah, which is uh, a water filtration system, so you're not getting the smoke directly. But people who do smoke struggle to quit, and they often will describe cigarettes as being their best friend. It is almost impossible for some people to quit, and they will have to make five to seven quit attempts or even more. But each quit attempt gets them closer and closer to quitting. When you come to cardiac rehab, we're going to ask you to measure your blood pressure at home. And your optimum and your best blood pressure is under 120 on 80. Some of you are going to say, Michelle, no problem. My blood pressure is under 120 on 80. And that's because you're on medication for heart failure and other medication to bring that blood pressure down. So it is key that you monitor your blood pressure at home. And if you have high blood pressure, we may ask you to do an ambulatory blood pressure monitor to see that during rest at night, that you would be lower, having a lower blood pressure so your heart experiences that lower blood pressure while you're sleeping. What do you do if you have high blood pressure besides taking your medications? You can follow the DASH diet, which uh, is a known proven diet to show that you can decrease um, uh, following the diet and decreasing salt, losing a bit of weight, exercising will help you also in addition to decreasing your blood pressure, but you are not to stop taking your medication. Diabetes. Diabetes, as I described before, is multiple uh, risk, it is multiple things in one. It is abnormal blood pressure, abnormal cholesterol, and abnormal blood sugar. And it puts you at two to three times higher risk of developing a heart attack or a stroke. A diabetic is more likely to die of a heart attack than a non-diabetic, and 80% of diabetics will have heart disease. Now, I you will find me talking a lot about death in this lecture. And I did have someone say to me, well, you know, it would be okay if you didn't talk so much about death. A little positive um, a spin on the lecture would be a good idea. But what cardiologists care about is something called MACE, which is Major Adverse Cardiovascular Endpoints. And those endpoints are, is the drug I'm putting you on likely to decrease your chances of having a heart attack, a stroke, death, or hospitalization? Those are the big ones. So that's why we often talk about decreasing your chances of having a cardiac event and death. When we talk about obesity, I want you to think about obesity as being your packaging. So every one of us is a different height and a different weight. So your body mass index has a way of kind of equivalent, uh, um, kind of making it equivalent. If your body mass index is above 30, you are two to six times more likely to have heart disease and have other risk factors. So I want you to think of BMI as being your packaging. So if you're six foot tall and 180 pounds, you're a bit on the boxy side, but you're okay. But you're now 180 pounds and you're five foot tall, you are a little bit boxy. And that packaging is basically uh, concentrating your weight along that belly area. And that belly area is active fat and that's sending hormones and that's how the hormones talk to the rest of your body so your body is connected in that it's sending hormones to your brain saying i need to eat more it's pushing against your liver and your pancreas pushing you towards high cholesterol and accumulating it in around your liver and also predisposing you to diabetes so it matters what your packaging is it matters whether you have that active belly fat and when we talk about your waist measurement, it's not where you wear your belt, it's at the point of your belly button. So what we talk about um, a weight, in cardiac rehab, there's a waist measurement that talks about where your waist circumference should be. And typically it's under 41 inches if you're a Caucasian male and under 31 and a half inches if you are a, um, if you are um, um, maybe in the high risk group and you're female. So it matters. If you are pear-shaped, you are less likely to develop heart disease because your waist is a little bit thinner. But if you are apple-shaped with the belly, the belly around the waist, and where diabetics will gain their weight, that, then you are higher at risk of heart disease. The alcohol and mucus alcohol guidelines just came out, and these are worldwide guidelines. And unfortunately, it talks about no more than two drinks a week. 
that's awful during COVID because all of us unfortunately increased our alcohol with staying home. Typically before it was no more than two drinks a day, no more than four days a week, but now it's no more than one to two drinks an entire week. So you can't accumulate all that on a weekend and say, great, I get to drink all my drinks on a weekend. No. And I know certain cultures, a glass of wine a day is perfectly fine or a beer a day is perfectly fine. But now the new guidelines have come out, certainly in um, certain disease states, if you've got a stent or if you're on a blood thinner, you've got to watch how much alcohol you're consuming because it puts you more at risk of developing a bleed. I love this slide because it talks about where we're at. The starting point for all of us in cardiac rehab. You want me to start exercise, baby steps, I call it. You want me to start exercising? Well, how fast do you want me to walk? How far do you want me to walk? What's my optimum aerobic heart rate? And do I have the right shoes? And that brings me to the next slide, which says no complicated machines in cardiac rehab. The only thing we're looking for is we're looking for a decent pair of running shoes that are hard sold and we're looking for a water bottle. That is it. That is it to your complicated machines. We're asking you to exercise after a while, after you've started cardiac rehab, at least up to seven times a week if you can do it. And you're going, but it's winter outside. I can't go outside and exercise and I don't have a gym in my house. What do you want me to do? Well, there was a 90 year old I knew about that exercised in her apartment building where she went across the hallway, down a flight of stairs, 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 took the elevator back up to the 18th floor and started all over again and kept going down. So exercising and doing stairs is actually useful. So that may not work for some of you. You may live in a house and you're going, well, what do I do now? Well, during commercials, get up and walk. You can also, um, you can walk on the spot to get that 10,000 steps. I know that I have a Fitbit, but not everybody can afford a Fitbit. So I like it when my Fitbit buzzes and that means I've hit my 10,000 steps. But remember, you may be able to get that on your phone or a pedometer. You could also um, go to Cambridge Mall. I know someone who lost 77 pounds walking at Cambridge Mall when the mall was closed because with the mall is open you're more likely to go shopping and we don't want to encourage that so you you can park closer there's perfect uh perfect weather conditions there are bathrooms there are benches there's no rain or weather inside the mall and you can walk in and out in and out in and out in and out and it is open now for you to walk even during COVID, as long as there's not a surge. So maybe check it out. That may be a place that you can walk and you don't have to join a gym and get extra equipment. Now, exercise will affect your mental health. And I say this because when people come to the initial lectures of cardiac rehab, I'll be honest with you, none of you are smiling. None of you are happy. Oh gosh, you want me to be here and I've got all these appointments. If you are, have heart disease, you may develop uh, or you have depression, you may, this, this depression may be a barrier to you coming to exercise because you may make excuses. You're going to say to me, I'm, I'm not in the mood. I can't come today. But if you're exercising with your partner, maybe your dog or a pet, or you're exercising with your neighbor and you're doing this at home, the day that you don't want to exercise, they're going to say to you, come on, let's go. And you'll say, I'm not really in the mood. And after it, you're going to say, well, I'm glad I came. I feel much better. Within three weeks to six weeks, there's been articles to say that it actually affects your mood and it affects your muscle strength. And you will notice a difference because when people come to cardiac rehab, within three to six weeks, we're noticing they've got a big smile on their face. Even in the winter, they're happier. They're leaving. They've got this big smile on their face. Maybe it's because they're done for the day or they're just happier because they're starting to, these hormones, these happy hormones or endorphins are starting to be released. But exercise will affect how you feel. And you've got to think about that person that's busy running outside and doing 10 kilometers, even in the winter. And you're going, what possesses that crazy person to go running outside even in the winter? And I realize 
they're releasing their happy hormones or endorphins and that's what makes them want to exercise and when you don't exercise you're going to feel off that day realize that risk is a continuum and that risk can be multiplied and only smaller elevations in your risk of perhaps that family history and that inactivity diabetes smoking multiple things weight will all result in you developing and developing heart disease so you just have to make modest changes we also want you to know your numbers know what your cholesterol is know what your ldl is know what your hdl is know what your triglycerides are we want them under two we want your hdl to be above 1.3 if you're a male female above 1.1 if you're male hdl under 1.8 uh total cholesterol under four but now you could do one genetic test called lp little a and tell you one in six people are uh, are predisposed to die uh predisposed to cardiac disease you can find out from the genetic test if that's you at this point we're going to have a talk about when you resume normal relations with your partner this is a very big one and we had an 83 year old sitting in our lecture that said geez if you're going to talk about sex i would have brought my husband and we're like way too much information for me but Having said this, it's a big part of people's lives. So when can you resume normal relations with your partner? When you can climb two flights of stairs and walk briskly without any symptoms, you may be safe. So have this conversation with the doctor or the nurse. And we do have a four page handout, no pictures on it, but a four page handout in the gym that basically says, what are some tips and how can you uh, resume normal relations with your partner? You have to slow down to reduce work on the heart, avoid positioning where you're holding up your weight, spoon or snuggling position with uh, behind your partner and the healthy partner on top to reduce your to uh, workload on your heart. I see some people laughing and I'm glad that brought a chuckle to some of you on a Saturday morning. Okay, so you, some of you will say to me, you haven't convinced me yet. Talk to me, give me real numbers. Why should I be coming to these 40 appointments for cardiac rehab? Well, all cause mortality down by 25%. What did that mean? There are nine of us on this lecture. So that means if there were eight of us on, two of two people would not be uh, dying because you came to cardiac rehab. One in five, if there was 10 of us on this lecture, two people would not be going to hospital because you're in here. And the reason is by coming to cardiac rehab, we're picking up things earlier. You're not getting as far along and we're catching things before you get into trouble. Recovery time, if you've had a bypass or if you've had a sternotomy, is down by 50%. We're going after four behaviors that affect seven disease states, including heart disease, cancers. All but two cancers are not affected by exercise. Diabetes, respiratory diseases such as asthma, COPD, and other ones, osteoporosis, oral health and mental health, all of this, but we're actually going after four behaviors, not just physical activity. Another way to look at it is if I was to come to cardiac rehab and alongside of that, I'm also uh, changing my diet and I'm improving it. My um, heart chance of a heart attack goes down by 39%. I cut down my alcohol, my chances of cancer go down by 27%. I increase my physical activity, all cause death goes down by 37%. And I quit smoking, my chances of cancer down by 53%. So keep in mind that cardiac rehab is doing all cause death. And then your next question to me is, well, if, all, if cardiac rehab is so great, why is everyone not doing it? Well, we're supposed to have at least 30 people in cardiac rehab and right now there's only nine of us on the lecture so not everybody invited to cardiac rehab will even show up for their appointments and after that not everyone is going to make some of these changes and not everyone is going to complete so what our goal is is if you can complete your cardiac rehab program just show up for as many appointments as you can you can expect a 24% reduction in total cholesterol. Sorry, there's a typo there. A 37% reduction in your bad cholesterol, which is almost the equivalent of a medication. It will be in addition to it. An 82% reduction in atherosclerotic plaque, 
a 23% reduction in increased flow, blood flow, which is, you're thinking of it, well, this could be like a Drano, Michelle. You're talking about opening up my arteries by increasing blood flow. And yes, this has been shown because exercise has been shown to be a medication. Exercise is considered a prescription. It is a true, it's going to show you some true benefits in addition to your medication and a 91% reduction in angina or chest pain. So some people will come to cardiac rehab to get ready to go for surgery. Now, we talk about heart disease as possibly being avoidable. Certain conditions not really will change, but most of heart disease, if it's related to atherosclerosis, is modifiable and controllable by you. And I mentioned that point early on that said 90% of your risk heart disease is modifiable and controllable by you. Heart disease is not, um, uh, heart, uh, changing to our heart healthy lifestyle is not deprivation. But right now, if I offered you an apple pie and an apple, I know what all of you would eat. But then you'd say to me, Michelle, give me the apple and I'll eat the apple with some cinnamon on it. I do not want to have to uh, eat, uh, exercise another hour to get rid of that apple pie and you will figure out ways to bring heart healthy habits into your life. Dr. Pandy does have a Twitter account and he does only do um, a cardiac related things. So I want you to realize you can follow him on Twitter. And there's no political things. At this point, we're going to ask for implied permission. I will ask if you wish not to be part of this registry that you let us know because otherwise everybody will be part of it. Now remember, HIPAA says we cannot use your name. So that's the privacy rules of Ontario that says we cannot use your name, we cannot give your name out, but you will become initials and we will compare our cardiac rehab program to the rest of Canada to see how we're doing and how we are improving. So perhaps if the Ottawa Hearts uh, uh, cardiac rehab program has a better um, smoking cessation, program that we can use part of their ideas and improve our cardiac rehab program. Our program has been mentored by the Toronto Rehab Centre, now part of UHN, and we are working alongside the Ottawa Heart uh, Rehab Program as well. And at this point, I'm going to stop recording and take questions.